Good afternoon. Welcome to Wednesday Bolton. Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, as usual on a Wednesday, it's me, Kevin, Colin and Brian. And every one of us is isolating because of COVID, which is utterly bizarre. <laughs> As Colin just coughs right on cue just, there. Just, just to make sure he's on it. <laughs> how's, every, how's everybody getting on? How's everybody getting on? Colin we were beat Warriors, now we're uh, <laughs> COVID casualties. The, the COVID crew today, um, uh, the place in good company. Nice to see and talk to people um, <laughs> since I kind of got to the house this week, so... Yeah, it's really nice to be here. Um, Colin, Colin how are you feeling? I'm desperate to break down some of these walls and get outside. <laughs> I mean, Greenock's not the nicest place in the world, but I'm actually missing it, and that tells you what isolation's like. Um, I bet I've you been Greenock... through oh, oh, so many box sets. I've <laughs> been playing football manager. I've still had to work. Oh, it's, it's brutal, but um, hopefully tomorrow I'll be out and about. And uh, I'll come and drive past all your houses just to gaze a wee wave. <laughs> Colin, see the first thing you get out, the air's going to smell sweeter, the people are going to be nicer, you are high-fiving strangers in the street. And I'll be straight over to get a slice roll. In fact, no, let's not get into that, let's not get into that. Well, let's not start it. I'm, I'm sure the Bahamas is feeling like, uh, uh, Greenock is feeling like the Bahamas when you look at your windy, Colin. Uh, Mate, there's, the there's blue skies, there's not a cloud in the sky. I'm absolutely jealous, although... I'm, I'm reading that the forecast is for snow for the next couple of days, so that is absolutely typical. Turns out it'll be more than 10 days isolation, if that's the case. Aye, definitely. I've, um, unfortunately, I'm household isolation. There's one member of my family tested positive, and unfortunately, everybody else is negative, but we still need to isolate unless the Scottish Government changes those rules later on today. Hopefully they will, and I can maybe get out for the weekend, all things considered. But at least we've got Celtic to keep us entertained, and Michael Nicholson has made a great start to the, this January transfer window. Now the January transfer window is now open, and why don't we to keep Jason Leach happy? And we've got players coming in. Um, but we'll go to the comments We'll go to the comments first. And Michael Newman, and I'll go to call him with this because I, I know you were doing the sums just before you came on there. Eh? And Michael Newman asks via YouTube, will Ange top 40 million plus in signings in his first season? Now, this is on the back of, eh, I think it was Sky Sports, mm -hmm. reporting that we are in talks with Tottenham Hotspur and Benfica over permanent signings of Cameron Carter, Vicar and Yota. Colin, are we going to top over 40 million pound in signings? Well, looking at it and doing the, the kind of quick math on it, it looks as like if we'll spend somewhere, if these two players do come in, in the region of 35 to £37 million pounds this season, which, all things considered, sounds a massive amount of money. Um, I think that the kind of what the total will be will come down to what Celtic end up paying for Cameron Carter Vickers. I think there's been talk that it's somewhere between two and a half and £10 million, pounds, and that's such a wide variety of where we're actually going to um, end up getting... Uh, the deal done for, but the fact that we are going out there is actually, um, you, you think that £37 million pounds is a lot of money, Celtic's actually broke even on that. When you look at the figures that's came in for the likes of um, Odson Edward, for even Jeremy Thrimpong last season, um, Ryan Christie, Christopher Ayer, the fees are very similar. So you're talking about rebuilding a team on the back of selling four players, and that isn't spoken about enough because yes we've got a lot of dead without the door we've managed to get some um players the fees that we've managed to get for some of them the likes of Patrick Clamalla still getting three and a half million pounds for him that's that's unbelievable um but you're still talking about five six players out to get what is basically a whole new squad in we're talking about by the end of this window potentially having brought in 15 to 16 new players which is a great return. Um, and it just shows you that the work that Ange has been doing behind the scenes, I saw someone say it in the comment section earlier on, he's been doing the work of a director of football and a manager at the same time. And he's definitely keeping the guys in the boardroom happy because they're continuing to back him, knowing that they are getting value for their money. But Brian, there is a... Football transfers are a complicated business. 
and what you see in the papers or what you, the figures that get bandied about on Sky Sports and stuff like that are not really the true figures. For example, if you get if a transfer fee is sixteen million pound, you'll be lucky to get six million of that up front uh, straight away. So Michael Michael Nicholson started here, but for Collins gave us the figures there. We well, haven't really changed. We well, haven't really changed tack. Whereas what we bring in is what we spend out. Going by those figures. Aye, but I, I think that's listen. I don't know if a business perspective. That's that's commercially viable, isn't it? If you spend more than you make, you know, a viable business. It's simple as that. And Celtic are, are risky versus enough that you know the, the model. As much as some of the transfers have been duds over the years, it, it has been working. You know, and I think. If you look at, as Colin alluded to there, if you look at getting in, we could end this transfer window with Jota and CCV and permanent figures. These three new guys in, you know, the guys we brought in at the start. Plus, you've still got assets that can go. You've still got Barkas, Ayeti, Paul and Goalie, probably Sorrow. Um, guys you get a, a few quid for as well. So, you know, we could potentially see that spending going up, but it's prudent. And the, the point we have to make is we, we're quick to criticise the board, and rightly so at times, but, you know, Nicholson, and it's probably Ange influence, but he's got these three guys that Ange wanted, and he's got them in, you know, actually the day before the transfer window started. That's great work. And he's been backed, and they've paid the money for them, and it looks like they're going to make the uh, short and CCD permanent as well. Again, that's backing the manager and rewarding these players, so as much as we, we, we give him grief, we have to give him credit as well, Nicholson, Although he's still radio silent, that's that's a very good start to his permanent tenureship. I think see when you look at it, the likes of the the money to be spent on Carter Vickers or on Jota, Celtic wouldn't have made that risk up front. There's no way back in the summer we'd we have spent six million pounds on each of those players. Right, this so loan to buy option. At, if you look at the five million for Barkas, five million for Ayeti, you can understand why it's, it's sensible. Uh-huh. When when you look at it, you've got the, the loan to buy market, which Celtic really haven't utilised a lot. They did try to do that for a Yeti, and then they were talked out of it. West Ham wanted the money up front. It was either you, you bought them up front or you didn't get them at all. So it's it's a difficult one, but when you see that and you see the performances that Jota and Cameron Carter Vickers have put in already this season, Jota's what, 21, 21 maybe? And Cameron Carter Vickers only just turned 24. There the other day, if they do sign on a permanent deal, you can guarantee that they'll sign for four and a half years in January if that's when it does happen. Because the, the idea will be they'll see the rest of this season out, they'll have the following season, and then the season after that is when we'll start considering any sort of bids that come in. And the likes of Jota, Carter Vickers, they'll only be 23, 25 at that point, 26 even. You're still going to get a high return on your investment on that. For me, it's, it's a no brainer, it just shows that. We do have the money to spend. It's just been wise enough to spend it. We've spent it incorrectly in the past. This loan to buy market, as much as people hate seeing us bringing in loans, it is a massive benefit to the club. It's a try before you buy. I think if you look at, sorry, uh, Kev, just quickly on that, if you look at uh, Maeda, he's technically a loan to buy, but the clause is we, the, the buy fee set, <laughs> we're buying them. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think like we ought to as well. I think the fee was agreed before he came. Mm-hmm. So the kind of being figure can suddenly say, well, well, we want ten million from we want twelve million. It has to be six, so it's been good business. Uh, my aid just seems to be like one of those uh, when you buy a couch, yeah, you get six months to pay it. You don't need you don't need to pay any money. For, uh, you don't need to pay any money for six months. AJSC Technology, um, a regular contributor uh, to a Celtic state of mind. Signing yacht and CCV will be the club's best insurance policy against not getting Champions League money next season, because they have big future transfer values. So takes the pressure off us. Colin, do you think that's a consideration of the club when making what what will be massive transfer fees for the club? Yeah, I, I do. Um, but I also think we're being prudent for the first time in a long time. You're looking at us actually strengthening this team in January to the point of when was the last time we added this amount of quality or these amount of players to a team? Well, I know we're still in transition. That's the, the sort of uh, stage that we're in. 
But it always got to January and you're thinking, do you know what, if we can build a team here in January for the second half of the season, it means that we can go into the Champions League qualifiers in June, July, whenever they start, and you're not sitting there with Owen O'Connell or Stephen Welsh or young guys like that who've been thrown in at the deep end. That's that's actually a bit, that's not fair on Welsh as such, but guys like Dane Murray, who will play maybe those two or three qualifiers, will fall out a favour and you'll never see them again. We actually need to be going into this... Um, this sort of set of qualifiers with a team that, yeah, okay, you maybe need to add one or two in the summer, but you're not talking about replacing one or two, adding in three or four and getting a settled team that by the time you actually make the Europa League group stage or the Conference League group stage, you're saying, oh, well, if we had this team back in the qualifiers, would I beat them? This is the first time that I can remember that we're going into this as a stronger team. So, okay, maybe we might not get the the top prize. So the top prize is winning the league. And that's almost a guarantee. Uh, I mean, it's not 100% guaranteed, but it's 99% guaranteed that you get straight into the group stage. The second prize there is Celtic will also still qualify for the Champions League um, qualifiers if we finish second this year. Mm -hmm. And if you're going into that, and are, okay, you're going to be playing stronger teams, but you're looking at the teams that we're putting out there just now, and you look at a team that played against Betis and against Leverkusen, and you're thinking, do you know what? If we can add a couple of players to that, then who knows? I'm not I'm not writing off the league at all. I still think the league's in our hands to go and win it. As long as it's still mathematically possible, it's in our hands to go win it. But it is almost an insurance policy, not to the fact that um, you can then go and sell them players. It's the insurance policy that when you get to the qualifiers, you've got a team that's up there with the rest of the teams that you're going to be competing against. Colin, it's a fair statement. We may finish second. I mean, we'll have to actually look at that. And you're, you're just looking at the way that the club will look at it. They'll go, well, we may finish second and we may have to go through these qualifiers. So therefore, we actually need to plan. Uh, come on the hoops. Uh, how's it going, lads? We need to get these these lads signed in this window. The club might bottle it in the summer. Uh, that, that's true. I want to get these guys tied up. I think they've been absolutely fantastic for us, and I want to get these boys tied up. And Pipes McBags uh, via YouTube, the criminally neg negligent board have not been forgotten. Brian, I asked on Twitter yesterday if anybody had any questions for the, for the Wednesday team, and Stevie Mullen asked a question which goes with Pipes' comment there, eh? and the Stevie Mullen uh, says, after the criticism of Michael Nicholson being appointed as CEO, what's the thoughts on his start? So what is what is your thoughts on Michael Nicholson's starts, considering uh, he was, he's was been the CEO, the, the acting CEO since the start of the season, basically. He's overseen the Bernard Higgins stuff, and now we're going into a transfer window, and he has made a decent start in the transfer window. So there's, there's positives and negatives. I'll do the negatives first because I think there might be more positives so far. Negatives are it's radio silence again. There's been very little to no game. I think they're in one statement, didn't they, at the New Year or just before when it was Christmas time. Um, there's been very little engagement. You know, the Bell and Higgins thing was a shambles. You know, you know, his involvement with that. So they're two two big negatives. And I think if he, if he, one of the things we have to change, we've been trying it for, is, is more engagement with the the sort of Celtic fans and the Celtic people. The positives, though, are he seems to be leaving the football to Ange to deal with. You know, he's no, he's no there at all. He's no micromanaging, but lots of things. You know, Ange has asked for players. He's got them in. He's got them in on time. Ange just told him he wants to the run of the, the club, essentially. Ange has got the, the youth players and the reserve players all cheering the same way as the first team. So there's a, a sort of pathway. He had a hand in recruitment the... The boy Anton uh, Macklin, the sports scientist. So it looks like Nicholson's sort of leaving the manager in charge of football affairs and he'll back him accordingly. Now, that may be way off the mark, but if that's true, that's a real positive for me moving forward. But, get back to the, the, the negative part, it, they do need for more engagement. It's something they've been crying out for. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how it, how it pans out over the course of the next few months and towards the end of the season. But, as I say, look, we criticise when they deserve it, and we have to we have to give them a hat tip when they deserve it as well. Because I can't remember a January where we've not had players a couple of loan signings in the last day of the window, or 
anything like that. Whereas we've got three players we're all very excited about, I think, and I'm sure we're going to talk about um, coming in. And they're in already. And just get a couple of weeks to get them train, get them in with the first team. And if we can sign CCV and Jota, that's a huge statement of intent for the rest of the season. And I think confidence will start to rise in that. And, um, so, yeah, so, so, far, so far, I would say probably 60 40 good. Maybe I've just been generous because it's, no, it's quite no, nice. No, 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 you're quite I think, nice. I think that's probably fair. Colin, what, what's your thoughts on Michael Nicholson? And also, also on his radio silence, do we really need our CEO to be a publicity hungry animal? <laughs> no, I mean, you've got a face of the football club right now. You've got Ange, who is he's out there for everything. He's out defending the club. He's out defending the supporters. He's out bringing the sort of reputation to the club. You look at it, who was one of Sky Sports' main interviews on Christmas Day? It was with Ange Postacoglu. Everybody is interested in what this story means to the club. So whilst he is he's out there as the face of the club, Nicholson can happily do what he's doing in the background. And... I think that's the kind of person that he is. I don't think you're going to ever see him come out and give the big pompous speeches that we saw very rarely, to be perfectly honest, from Peter Lowell, who was seen as the face of Celtic Football Club. He was seen as the guy that sort of pulled the strings behind the scenes. Nicholson might do that, but we might not see it. We might just see things happen and someone will say to him, oh yeah, well that was Michael that had the influence in doing stuff like that. And if that's the way he wants to work, that's fine. But there is going to be times where we do need someone who is going to come out and is going to have to back up the club, that is going to have to come out and back up the supporters because there's going to be situations down the line where Celtic Football Club's going to come under attack for a number of different things. And we need a face that's out there. And let's be honest, it's not going to be Ange that's going to come out and answer a lot of these questions. It's going to need to be someone behind the scenes that's going to need to do it. So... I'd like to see what happens when these situations come up before passing any judgment. I think quietly in the background he's doing what he's doing. The first one that he's of have obviously spoke about is the Bernard Higgins things and the silence on that. All you can say is at least they never get the job. And that's that's the only reflection that you can take on it. it there will be a time when I need or when the club needs Nicholson to step up for the supporters, to step up for the club and to be that face. But we've not seen it yet, so we'll I'll reserve judgment until such times occurs. Brian, Colin brings up a point there. I mean, are we just so used to a chief executive standing up and making the statements when other clubs have their chairman doing that? It was just the fact that our previous CEO was so powerful and our chairman so weak just means that we expect a CEO to come out and face the fans when it should really be a chairman's job. I, mean, I don't think you'd see you come to the fans, but you know, if you look at the when, when Don McKinney's very brief spell, his interaction, there was things that he was basically taking charge of what the club were doing. He'd done the um the Kano Foundation stuff and you know, there was things where he was sort of appearing and you don't you don't want your CEO to be the forefront of the club, right? Obviously you want to be Ange and you want him to be left to the football stuff. But there's other parts of a, a Celtic that I think, you know, the CEO should be sort of but I mentioned it about I say the Higgins thing was a key one. I think they could be engaging with, with, with fan media and mainstream media a bit more. Um, and I just think now and again, a, a real, you know, message of support or let them know they especially given the, the sort of air of what seemed to be um, disregard for the supporters. I think there is still a rift needs healing. And I think this would be the time where a CEO could now and again pop out with a statement, maybe thanking the fans for their support. Just, to, just we think, just silly we things, we gestures um, that we, we just don't really do. Um, but it's not a deal on end though. And if he sticks to, you know, organising the financial side of things and the leave signs to the football side, that's that's obviously what you want. And I don't listen. I don't think for a second Ange is going to be told off anybody how to control the football side of things. Uh, Whether it's been a lot longer than I I don't think for a second anyone's going to dictate to him do this, uh, do this. So, you know. I, I think the Celtic fan, my, my, my concept of what a CEO does at a football club has been uh, has been moulded because of we had Peter Law since 2003. 
and that's maybe a comp- he maybe had a completely different role at Celtic than other CEOs have got in other businesses of a similar level. And that's that's a point that Strachan's laptop actually makes. You won't see 98% of, of, of what the CEO does in an 80 million quid operation. Mm-hmm. And who's, who's news? Uh, a CEO should be able to take the brand into new markets, markets and concepts. Now that, that, that this is this brings me back to a question that I was going to ask you anyway, and I'll go to come to Colin first. If we get we've got the three Japanese lads in, and it looks like we're we're, we're a wee bit down the road with Cameron Vickers and with Yota. If this window is a success, does that put the end to the sporting director job? Or should we still get in a sporting director to back up Hughes News' comment that a CEO should not be handling football transfers? Colin? Do, do you know what? I'd leave that answer up to, to Ange. I would let Ange make the final decision on that. I think, obviously, he's understood that he's had to come in, he's had to rebuild a squad from basically scratch this season. He's known what his task was before he came here. When we had the chance to speak to Ange um, at the fan media press conference a couple of weeks ago, I asked him the question about what was his plans for stage two of the rebuild. And his big drive was on recruitment, both on and off the park. So unless anything's changed in the last couple of weeks, Ange still wants to bring in scouts. He still wants to bring in guys to help him with the recruitment side of the business. Now, We've known probably what since June that we needed to get someone in um, to do uh, what do you call it, like sports science. It took them to November, December time because they went and they picked the right candidate. In the meantime, things ran in the background, maybe not to the level that they should, but they they ran and we kind of continued to work it and tick over. We've just seen what's happening right now with bringing in guys um, from all over the world. We're looking at guys from Japan, we're looking at uh, bringing in guys from Portugal, England. It looks as if we're just about to get a deal over the line from a, for a boy from Ireland as well. So, we are putting a lot of effort in and I'm just putting a lot of effort in just now. I think eventually there'll come a point where he'll say, do you know what? I don't want to be working 24 hours a day. It'd be good to have someone that I can kind of bounce ideas off of and get a bit of time back. But he knows right now that that's his requirement. And that's what he's put into the club. He's said it times and time again that he's already explained to his family, he's explained that Celtic's going to come first. But that can't always be the case. And I think you'll see maybe not this window because the focus will be bringing in players. But maybe February, March time, you'll maybe see someone come in on the recruitment side of the business. Brian, what do you think of that? Yeah, I think probably... I don't think that, see, depends what you mean by a sporting director. The sporting director, director of football, technical director. What you might find is Ange is in charge of all football affairs as manager, and then you have like a technical director. And then what they do is they basically um, kind of collate all the information from recruitment, scouting, academy, and bring it to him and say, look, this is where we're at, this is who we're looking at, we should think so he can concentrate football and then liaise directly with the technical director who basically will oversee every other football department. So Andrew will be in control of it, but it'd be like, if you imagine like any business, imagine like a like a shop, right? Imagine like Top Man or something. You have like an area manager and you have a store manager. So store manager will recruit staff and do this, the area manager will tell them, and then they go to their, you know, their boss, who would be Ange. So it just filtered down. So I think probably as Collins right, he'll probably get it all together and then get someone to oversee it, maintain it while he can then focus on the, the football side of things. I think you look at no the greatest example because they're rotten at the moment, but if you look at Man United, they done that with Darren Fletcher. So he actually he's a technical director. So he controls kind of like he's basically oversees football affairs for the academy up. But what's underneath the manager? Whereas a sporting director or a director of football what's above the manager, like the boy Faye Dortmund, I can't remember his name. He basically oversees and hires managers and stuff. So that it is two different things, but I can see someone basically coming out and being in charge of that side of things and letting Ange get on with business. Because you have to think, you know, you look at Ange and you look at the job he's done while rebuilding a squad on the park, rebuilding a club off the park, trying to rebuild relationship with the fans. 
and he didn't do that all himself. So how much more could he give to the team if other people do all that? It's exciting times, but I think I would expect that he'll get someone in, but I don't think it'll be someone who's senior to him, if that makes sense. See, see when you look at it as well, though, there has to be a succession planning job underway at Celtic. Yeah, I mean, Ange Postacoglu, as much as I'd love him to be here for the next 10, 15 years, there's every chance that he'll maybe only be here for a couple of years. And then what happens? If we keep relying on Ange to John, sort of look John at... John Kennedy gets a job. Ah, well. But that's why I think you have, you have someone that oversees the rest of us. So like, there is a continuity. Because at the moment, see, we Ange, Ange is coming himself. He'll probably leave himself. It's not like when Rogers came in. Rogers bring an entourage. And it was great when he left to take them all with him and we never replaced them. Angie, I think I feel like, and I might be wrong, but I feel like Angie's building something to, to maintain that, whether he's there or not, if that makes sense. Well, that's what I hope anyway. See, be, see, when you look, see, when you look at it, the last person who was sort of head of recruitment that sort of saw through a couple of managers was um, the guy Park. John, John Park, Park was there for, for about three or four different managers. And it meant that when a manager was replaced. He had the scouting system and the structure there that he could bring someone in. Ronnie Dyla had the same access as what Neil Lennon had. And you look at guys that came in over that period that we managed to turn around. We kept that same sort of system going that we brought in an unknown quality player. Guys like Victor Winyama, like Virgil van Dijk. We honed them here at Celtic and then turned them around. Since then, you've had guys like Lee Congerton, You've had um, Nick, who was Hammond. The Nick Hammond. Yeah, Nick Hammond. We've had other guys that have come in and out who have been responsible for Celtic. <laughs> well, that, that's basically it. Now, if you keep going on that cycle, see the worst thing was to happen and Ange had to leave tomorrow. There's no one there to keep that structure going because Ange has been the main man. So it is imperative that, okay, maybe Ange doesn't want to be have someone senior, that's fine. But at least have someone who... Celtic, the board can trust to say, do you know what? Here's our new manager. Can you help him till he gets his right men in? No, we didn't want to keep banging on about Poster Coglu leaving because we didn't want the big fella to go anywhere. <laughs> absolutely not. Absolutely, absolutely not. not. Give, him a, give him a lifetime deal. Give him a lifetime deal. David Bradley, no Ange does it all himself. What a guy. Uh, Durban Clushy, our chairman is straight out of the office. Uh, Johnny Ryan, Ange will determine who comes in. Uh, Michael McDonald and should handle all the transfers Robert Wallace makes an actual great point the manager tells the CEO who he wants and not the tail wagging the dog and I'm going to bring up a resident Hibs fan Paul Cockwell what about the Boyle story that's not going away let's deal with some absolute rumours Brian I saw you shaking your head there so you go first uh, yeah, I, I, I just don't see it happening um, I think He's, he's done well for Hibs, but it's Hibs only having a great season, really. So I just I just don't see what, what he offers more than what's there. He's pacier than some of the winners, but that's it. I think he's what, what is he, 27 now? It just feels like mm-hmm. it's a massive step up. And are you going to really redevelop a player at that age and that amount of time that's, no, that's played for Hibs and a struggling Hibs side? I, I don't see it, uh, to be honest. I disagree with you. I'd take him every day of the week. Every single day of the week. I think he's got something that the Celtic team don't have at the minute. And it's the not just the pace, but the fact that he can play in those two roles of the, the striker and the winger, where as far as all we've seen so far is Abada can potentially do that. And Abada's sort of couple of performances that he's had so far this season, not been the greatest. He's good at set plays. He's good at kind of, he's someone that when you look at where our squad weakness is at the minute, it's down the flanks. Would I play him over uh, Mikey Johnson every day of the week? Colin, I'd play him over Mikey Johnson. That's not a good example. Uh, but that, that's, that's your second choice left midfielder at the minute. That's who you've got there. So is he better than some of the players that's at the squad <clears throat> that we've got so far? Yes. The only thing is, would I pay £3 million for him? Absolutely not. There's, there's, it's sort of split in the comments, lads. Like you used to have split there, eh? Uh, Patrick, Patrick Harold Boyle, not Celtic class. 
Robert Wallace asked the question that you asked there, Colin, is he better than what we have? And I think this is, Brown Warrior brings up a comment and it says, Boyle has ripped the Rangers defence apart. No Celtic winner Linger has done that for two seasons. To be I fair, think... though, when they played Rangers, they were sitting in deep and Rangers were pushing up and they were just putting long balls and counter-attacking. Celtic, even if they had Boyle, when they play like that against Rangers, so it's a false equivalent. I get his point. It's a false equivalency. It's like when Ivan Sproul was at Hibs and he'd done that. He'd done it because he could do it against teams that were attacking and he had space. If he plays for Celtic, he's nowhere he, he's going to be facing the low blocks sort of thing. He's going to have space running behind. Don't see it. There's, there's, a a really good, Don't see it. there's a really good comment coming in here from Stephen Tomlinson. If it was cheaper, would Boyle be a Johnny Hayes type signing? Now, you think John, uh, was, I thought Johnny Hayes had a really good contribution when he was at Celtic. We picked him up for next to nothing. He put some great performances in, including that one um, over in Rome when we beat Lazio. And he left. He'd done his job. He was never a quality player, but he was a great squad player for Celtic. That, that's a decent point. I was trying to bring up the exact same comment <laughs> as you there, Colin. That's how it kept on disappearing for anybody. We apologise for anybody that was walk, watching on YouTube there and <laughs> wondered what was going on with that with, with Stephen's comment. Um, you're right, Gordon Ashley. Boyle is a no-brainer. Forrest not even close and Abad is not a winger. I would offer 1.5 million. And I'm going to bring up another comment by Brown Warrior. Henderson and, and Cash get it done. The Henderson question, Brian, brings you around to we have we seem to have a lot of dead wood in the squad, and it's all right getting players in, but you have to actually you have to actually balance the books as we've already spoke about, and sometimes you need to have that conversation with players that that, that they actually do need to leave, and it was something that uh, it was brought up to me on Twitter by Joe Smith. And what he actually says is, how much of a hit do you think Celtic should take on Barkas, Bowie and Ayeti to get them out of the door this window? These three guys need off the wage bill as soon as possible and could fund one quality signing. I, I think if, you, if we're spending £12 million on, on the two guys that are in the tagline, Yacht and Carter Vickers, and the £3 million what we've spent on the, the three Japanese lads, we're going to need to do a bit of balance in the books again. This this window to actually to stop the wage bill going up. So, what do you think the club will be looking to do to get rid of the three that Joe Smith actually mentioned? I think when you look at it, you're not going to get anything for for a yeti this window because you'll not pass a medical. He's 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 out for what seems to be quite a long period of time. So, a yeti is one you're going to have to be stuck with. That then asks the question then. If you do have someone that needs to leave, then who's going to be the one that sort of fills his his gap? I think if um, it looks as if Lee Griffiths is going to be back from Dundee, I think his contract will be torn up. I think Bolly will probably go maybe back to Turkey, whether it be on a, a loan with a permanent option or a permanent deal. Uh, and from what I'm hearing, because of the kind of injury crisis we've got at the minute, potentially it could be Barkas. That stays as well, so it's it's not the it's not the best situation. But I, I think we spent what between twelve million pounds on those three players: Barkas, Ayeti, and Bolly. I think if you get five for the three of them, that's that's where you're kind of sitting at right now. Now, I don't know about Barkas. I think Barkas will still go out on loan. I think we've, I think we've got enough goalkeeping cover there, especially if they, they rate the young uh, young Toby, I, whatever he's setting name is. Uh, oh, there you go. Uh, especially if they rate him extremely highly. They also do, whether we like it or lump it, they do actually still rate Scott Bain as well. So, And I'm sure Barkas is on far more money than Scott Bain. What, what do you reckon, Brian? I still, I still think that these players. I know Ayeti's got his hamstring problem at the moment, which could, as Colin rightly points out, which could kibosh any sort of move whatsoever. But I'm sure Barkas has still got a bit of credit in the bank in his homeland, and Ball and Golly will still have credit in the bank in Belgium and Austria, where he's actually played his football. I definitely, I think there's, 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 there's money and him. Um... Old hologram Hans Barkas. Um, when you get a couple of the phone figures you get for the American football, you try and keep them at Celtics, so you get big coins, you can catch something for a change. Um, 
I, I think he'll go, but I think what will happen is, I think all three of them will go, but I think it'll be a loan reaction to buys at the end. I think that will mitigate risk for clubs coming in. Um, so I suspect that's probably what happen. So you might not get the money up front, but if you know, if they want to keep them, they have to trigger a clause or whatever, to pull it. I, I think I bought a lot more than five million for the three of them. I think, I think you, you, I would take you probably need three and a half to four million each. I would say still, you got a Greek international, Swiss international, and then um, Paul and Goli, He's he's quite liked over in Turkey. And I think he's a he's a decent player. He's just no for there's various reasons he's not going to play for Celtic again. So, so I think so, there's so value. So there's, so also guys, like, um, there's also guys like Sean Urigidi who are probably going to go on loan. Henderson who's going to leave. Hazard who probably go. Um, maybe Mikey Johnson or Shimmer will seize away. So there's a, there's a lot of other players that could go first, but I think they're the three that you're going to get a decent, a reasonably decent transfer fee for. I, I think your fee for Ball and Golly is maybe a bit inflated considering that would mean we've made a profit on them. It would have been mm-hmm. three and a half to for. It was about 2.2, 2. 2.4 we spent on Ball and Golly. I, I get that. And then we got these last year. Something like that. So I get that. Again, it's all these undisclosed transfer fees. Nobody knows mm. what you've actually paid for players and that. Brown Warrior, again, I'm I'm bringing his comments up because I found this man quite funny. Send ball and golly to Ibiza. I'm sure Ibiza have got a team that plays in the, the, the Spanish second, div- second, second division. They were in uh, the top league a couple of years ago. They, they were that. Uh, Producer Paul comes in to tell anybody that's interested that Arsenal v Liverpool was postponed due to Liverpool's problems with COVID. Um, let's Liam Shaw. I'm going to go to Colin about Liam Shaw. Um, interesting if he actually goes on loan to St. Johnson, eh? Mm, I mean, he could have picked a better team in Scotland to go to, but um, I think he'll offer a, a, a solid option to them there. St. Johnston have been one of the worst teams I've seen play this season. They offer absolutely nothing going forward. Sure, what will he bring to them? Depends where they play him. If he plays that sort of defensive holding role, it means Ali Crawford will be the one that's got to try and link up the the attack to the midfield. If you play him in that further forward role, he's sort of playing alongside Crawford, but they'll probably have to sacrifice a striker. They've only got really one striker up there at the minute. Um... Stevie May scored a couple of goals. Chris Kane just kicks anything that's above the ground. Um, it's good for him to go and get minutes. I'd like to see him potentially at a top six side and not a side that's battling relegation, to be honest. Chris Kane just seems to kick anything. It's in a Celtic jersey. He doesn't seem to do it to anybody else. Uh, I've got a friend who's a St. Johnson fan. I've spoke about him many a time on this programme. I know I'm waiting on the text message to say, and he's going to ask me, Brian, what kind of player is Liam Shaw? And I'm going to need to tell him, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't care what kind of player Liam Shaw is because I haven't seen enough of him. Aye, that's the reality. We've not seen enough of him. I think we guys like we, we Shaw and Urigidi, if they go on loan, I think post will be very careful about the type of club they go to just in terms of how they train. Because you see how intensely training is and stuff. And, and to be fair, when we saw Urigidi, I, I slaughtered Urigidi at the start of the season, but actually, he was good against Patisse. Still played that position, he was good. Um, and the improvement there is because of obviously the training. So they put in the high intensity training and stuff. I think he's going to want to send, if they're going to stay in Scotland, he'll probably want to send them to a club who trains, not in a similar way, but has a certain level of professionalism, of of. Because at they point you send him in loan for six months and he comes back out of shape or not quite in Celtic shape. It's a waste of time. So I would like them to go and loan to Scotland because then they're playing against the same opposition you can engage them a bit more. But I think they'll probably look at somewhere down south that's a bit, that's maybe more in line with some of his training uh, methods. Because again, if he sees a future for them, I don't see them. Because when you look at even GM Marcus and some of the guys that come into Celtic this season, obviously good players. And they might not have had the pre-season, but they're still fit. And they can't deal with post Colgus training. Or it's taken them a long time to get there. So if you've got players like what, Sean Urigidi, and you send them to C.S. and Johnson, who maybe don't train as intensely, even if they do really well there, they're going to come back. And they might have actually regress as players, although they're playing every week. Or it's certainly fitness-wise. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see where they go. But I do fully expect them to go. And the other one I think we might get money for is we Sorrow. I expect Sora to go as well. 
Colin, what's your thoughts on Sorrow? Do you think his ship has sailed? Is he the one that we're having a conversation with? That we, we, with parents here, sometimes you, you've got a son or daughter who wants to be a vet and tend horses and nice pastures and roll in the hills. Then you need to say to them, by the way, McDonald's has got a great management program, mate. They think sorrow. They think sorrows in that in that sort of boat. I mean, I'd like to think you'll get something better than McDonald's, but um, when I look at the the kind of the clips that we've seen of Eddie Gucci, and I've probably murdered that already, um, he is a very similar player to Sorrow, except for he seems to throw himself about more. He's like the sort of John Terry of defensive midfielders who puts his body on the line time after time after time. He seems to have a bit more composure on the ball, which is something that I think Sorrow was still trying to get. Um, I look back at some of his performances last season, especially when he was brought back in um, around about the time that we played Lille. And then he scored that cracking goal against Dundee United. Uh, that was his sort of best spell in a Celtic jersey. But from that point onwards, his performances and the level that he could kind of get to sort of to dip. We've not seen much of him this season that suggests that he's going to be up there and challenging for that defensive midfield role. I think it's going to be between um, guys like Beaton, Idiguchi, and McCarthy that's in there. You don't need a fourth choice to centre defensive mid, especially if you are um, you're kind of still young and you want to get yourself into the game. It'll be up to Ange whether he goes on loan or if he goes away permanently. I still think that for the betterment of his career, is probably away from Celtic and away from uh, fr- from Scottish football, to be perfectly honest. I don't think it ever suited him. Ewan Boy Martin comes in and he says, Sorrell's ship has sunk. When you mentioned John Terry there, Colin, I thought there were so many places that I thought you could have took that, but I'm quite glad <laughs> that you only that you only stuck to football. Stay, stick any, on the park. Stick on the park. John Terry actually posted a picture of himself going skiing the other day there in his private jet, and it just screams, you are an utter beep, beep, beep. But there we go. Let, let, let's let's um, turn Japanese. Let's speak about the three Japanese guys, because Colin, you mentioned it. Uh, 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 Ida Gucci, or just call me Gucci, as as as, uh, as he says. Kyogo's got us really excited about these guys. <laughs> he has got us really. Kyogo's a natural talent, and we've got the you've got Dan Orowitz and the other guys for the J League. And the, the J League watchers are going. Oh, my Ada's actually better than, than Kyogo. We're, we're, we're getting really, really, we're getting really, really great reviews about Hatati and that as well. And you've got Ida Gucci, who seems to be that sitting six. He's maybe not coming with a, a, a biggest symphony orchestra as other two, but people say uh, he is going to do a job for us. Brian, are the three starters? Uh, do these three walk into the side? So it's interesting. It, I think it depends on where Hatati plays. So, and he's, I read a thing earlier, I was looking at it, and in his last 50 games, 19 of them were centre mid. 17 were left back, and then there's a spluttering of left wing, right wing, attacking mid. If he comes in at left back, I could probably see the three of them starting. I think it would be Maeda out left, he'll go Jota when he's fit, um, Gucci, McGregor, Rogic, Juranovic, CCV, Welsh, um, Hatati, and Hart at the back. I think that's probably your strongest team. I think Hatati's coming in to start. Gucci's the interesting one. It de- so it depends where Postacoglu, if he says Cal McGregor is a is a you know the six or the eight. I think that's going to dictate who starts. If he prefers him sitting, then Gucci's in the bench along with Beaton. But I suspect he likes him a bit further up, linking the play. So then probably Gucci will start. So yeah, I, I think Maeda and Hatati are definitely see starting. Hatati I see starting where he's left back or centre mid. By the way. Um, but I think if he goes to left back, Gucci will come in. Um, but again, there's loads of, but the exciting thing about Hatati, he seems to be the one that there's loads of buzz about. Maeda's getting the press, but I've seen a lot of things with people talking about Hatati and how he's going to really, you know, have a massive impact. He's only 24, looks a real player, but it depends where he's going to play for me. I think that's the kind of interesting thing, and I think that directly will affect the, the other ones. But Maeda, I see starting. 
he's um he seems to be the boy, doesn't he? Colin, before I come to you, Facebook user, hopefully it's not the same Gucci you find down the bars. Uh, we're all hope we're all hoping that. What Brian said there, I do not see Hatati as a left back whatsoever. He's there to play in the midfield and on the left wing. The left back situation for me is tied up with Greg Taylor and uh, Liam Scales. Hatati is there to give, uh, obviously, Turnbull's now injured, but for me, Hatati was coming in to actually give Turnbull a break in the middle of that park. And I see him playing in the midfield, Colin. Yeah, I'd agree with you there. I think your midfield three, probably, um, if they are all available for the game against Hibs, will probably be. Um, McGregor, Hatati, and Rogic. Um, if that's the three that you've got available, I think there was a there was a good comment came in there and it says we've maybe got that first box to box midfielder that we've not had for a long time, and I've been saying that all season. I don't think we've got that box to box midfielder. Um, someone I think someone in the comment section said probably as far back as um, Stuart Armstrong, but Hatati seems to have something that Armstrong doesn't have, and that's pace. Oh, Stephen Tomlinson there. Um, Hatati seems to have a lot of pace as well. And you're seeing that's why he's been played sort of out on the left-hand side. He's been pushed further forward to the left. And having that versatility isn't necessarily a bad thing, considering the way that um, we've picked up injuries this season. So he was put in at left-back to cover an injury in the J-League. He then made it into the Japanese uh, Olympic side at left back as well because that's where they, they felt he was best positioned. Uh, look, if he can play consistently in both positions, that's two positions we've managed to cover in the team, which is great. If he's more suited to the centre midfield role, we'll see that when he starts playing. It's not necessarily a bad thing to have someone that can play in more than one position. Um, no. Uh, as it call, uh, as in calling with the amount of injuries that we've had this season, and it's the amount of guys who can do a couple of jobs and unpost the Coglu's team that we've actually needed. I mean, uh, Brian, I, I'm going to come to you, come to you with this. I mean, I, I think sometimes that David Turnbull and Tom Rogic, especially Turnbull, has been asked to do a job that he's not suited for, and he's done it extremely well. He has done it extremely well before getting what for me was a fatigue injury. That injury when he pulled up in the cup final was just because he had played far, far too many minutes. But I always saw Turnbull as a, a square peg in that round hole. And Atati probably f I, I seems to have the the profile to fit that role better in a Postacoglu midfield. Yeah, I think that's probably right. I, I'm a big fan of Turnbull. I think he's an excellent footballer. But I've said on here a few things. I'm concerned about him off the ball. I think he's not naturally that great off the ball. He doesn't press that well. He's not got that sort of natural fitness and energy and speed to cover the park. And I think Poster Poster sort of wanted him to. Um, and it has, there's times he does it, but it's just no natural for him. Um, but there's such quality there that you can see why he's still on the side. Um, the common thread, I mean, whether Hitati plays centre mid left back or Maeda plays up front out wide, wherever they play, the common thread that has been reported is how Athletic all three are. Mm -hmm. They're very strong, very fast, very powerful, you know, can run for, for run for days, cover every plane of grass. And that's exactly what Posta Coglu demands. And I think that's where Turnbull falls down a bit. In saying that, Roger isn't that type of player. So Posta Coglu does have space in that system for one of these players who not necessarily a luxury player, but offer that bit a difference without having to press. So I think you're right. I think it will be moving forward, regardless of what the midfield three is. I think it will be either Rogic or Turnbull moving forward. I don't think there'll be too many times you see them both again, if I'm honest, because it seems like because I mean like there was a uh, I think it's an article yesterday about um, Maeda about how he's he's a, an incredible athlete, like lightning quick, so strong, you know, so fit. You just run for days, and it seems like that's the mold. Especially when you look at uh, Kyogo and how tireless he is in his work. I think that's the in McGregor as well. By the way, like there's one thing that I think McGregor doesn't quite get credit for is the amount of running and moving and covering he does over the park. It's exceptional, and I think that's the benchmark. And Pumbo, I think it's either him or Roger fit in that sort of I call it a luxury role, but I don't quite mean that. That's disrespectful. But no, that's no, a, no. That's a, that's sort of. They can do something different, but I don't think you'll have two of them anymore. You're right. I, 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 
Colin, uh, Brian's right there for me. I agree with him. I always saw Turnbull and Rogic as two number 10s trying to fit in a, a, a poster call system. Mm-hmm. The, the only midfielder that we've got in the squad at the moment that can play all three roles in a poster call midfield is Callum McGregor. Mm-hmm. McGregor could play in any of any of those three roles. And for me, the, the bringing in Hatati gives you a num- a, another number eight. A, a, a more natural number eight of what we've currently got in the squad and leaves Turnbull and Rogic to bat, battle it out for the number 10 role. For me, the number six role, uh, Edi Gucci has probably came in there to give beat on competition when we mm-hmm. need beat on and McCarthy competition when we actually need a more sitting midfielder. That There's another role there. It could just be that he's an upgrade on Sorrow to actually sit there, but for me, I'm actually looking for an upgrade on beat on. I'm actually up. I'm actually looking for a an out and out defensive midfielder because we do need one. McCarthy and beat on beat on has been utterly heroic in December. I must admit, he's he's mm-hmm. he, he, he shut he, he shoved my criticism right down down my down my throat. But then, what do I know? I mean, Neil Lennon twice, Brendan Rodgers, Ronnie Dyler, and numerous uh, uh, Israel managers have gave him dozen of caps. So what they actually know about like the the, the ability of near beat on as a footballer, just as a football fan, he's just never excited me as a player. But we're we're looking at Ida Gucci as a number six. We are mm. when these guys come in, I'm going that he's a new defensive midfielder. It'll be interesting if he sees if we see him go in there straight away because that is such an integral part of the team. And if you get that wrong, then it can put the team completely out of kilter. If you've got a central defensive midfielder that you can rely upon, who is the person that's going to sit in front of your back four, that is going to start the plays from the back, because that's the way Celtic play. We play out from the back and then get the ball up to the forward line. That's a lot of trust you're putting in that one player. That's how McGregor playing in that position this season has been pivotal because he is the one who turns it around and gets it forward. It's been a criticism of Beaton in the past, although over the last couple of months he has changed that about how slow he was in that transition period. So I think it's almost the biggest risk to put a brand new central defensive midfielder into that system because of how pivotal that role is. And I think that might be the reason why you don't see Edeguchi right away. We'll maybe see him in the cup game. We'll maybe see him in some of the other games um, at Celtic Park, maybe against a, a lower opposition. But the likes of Hibs on a Monday night, the first one back, I, I just think he'll go with the tried and tri- tested there because of how important that role is to his whole system. Brian, I agree with you. I actually for once agree with Colin that beat on for me is in the start is at the top of the pecking order in the defensive midfielders uh, based on based on the last six based on the last couple of weeks. I'm just actually picturing uh, either Gucci turning up at recreation part and Alawa fake Gucci and Alawa and there's plenty of there's already plenty of fake Gucci and Alawa. Um, I just see him turning up at recreation park and going, what am I doing here? <laughs> this is on an Astro Turf pitch, a great a great view of the local hills. Uh, I, I actually would love to see that just to see his face, actually. But let's get back to the serious stuff. I, I do agree with Colin. I think Beaton's at the moment has got that defensive midfield role uh, tied up. And for me, Hatati and Maeda were the only two that walk in. They're the only two I expect to see against Tibbs. Possibly, but it's so if you admit. But- my only concern with that is if your midfield three is if Hattati's in there and Beaton's in there, it means you're dropping Roger or McGregor. And I don't think he will. I think Roger and McGregor are the two dead to start. That's why I think if you see, that's why I think for to play Hattati, they might play him at left back. Because if he's so comfortable in both and they're playing a vertical full back role, maybe having an extra midfielder in there, that's why I think he might play him there because of how close they get to midfield. And then he's got the option of bringing off Turnbull, Gucci, whatever, off the bench to replace these players. Um, I don't see it's either for me, Gucci, McGregor, Rogic, Beaton, McGregor, Rogic, and then you can rotate between the, the three. Um, <laughs> 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 right, that's it, Keith. Um, 
So again, that's, that's the thing. So if you play Beaton and Hatate, who are you going to drop? It gives a good option because it means he can rotate the midfield a bit more and there's nobody able to do it. But again, I think that's why, you know, you see Hatate at left back and either Gucci or... Because I, I do agree, I think Beaton is made the number six role his own and I do prefer McGregor forward in the eight. So I think the only question is, is it Gucci or Beaton? Gucci or Nero? And that, um, the sort of head of that midfield... <laughs> Um, and then Hatati either come off the bench or playing at left back. I might be totally wrong. We might, we might do something wacky and play day, but that's just my instinct. That, that's your instinct that he's left, but that, that, that he's going to play at left back. Colin, Maeda, Kyogo, and one other is the front three for me. Jota. Jota, when Jota's, Jota. whenever Jota's fit, that's the front three for me. And for one thing, I can't wait to see the front three. I cannot no. wait to actually see that. I'm, not, you, I'm a bit Man United about that. Do you know, I think you'll not even see them as a sort of a solid front three. I think it'll be very fluid. I think you'll see Jota coming in towards the middle um, and then you'll see a lot of me that sort of coming anywhere across the box to pick up where Kyogo won't be going. See, when you think about it, it's exactly what we could have done at Ibrox earlier on in the season when you had Edward and Kyogo play up front, as you could have had um, Kyogo coming into the positions where Edward, if he hit the front post, Kyogo hit the back post, but we didn't do it. We kept Kyogo too far out on the left-hand side and he was sort of like pushed into the corner by Balogun. It was only when we changed it up and put Kyogo through the middle. If he'd have changed it up and had Eddie out left in that game, I mean, he's not the best. He wasn't the best out there, but he, I think he'd have offered a lot more if he'd just changed it around and you had your full-backs overlapping. But I think that's maybe where you'll see a lot more of like Sir Ralston, Juranovic, Taylor, Scale, whoever's going to be playing on the two full-backs. They'll have a lot more opportunity to get balls over and you'll not just have one striker in the box to try and put it in. You'll have players coming from all over to go on the end of it. And we spoke about, what was it, 80 crosses against Livingston. We didn't score a single goal. I don't think you'll see too many of those performances in the second half of this season. Hopefully not, Colin, but as Joe Porter uh, comes in, and he quite rightly points out, we know nothing about these new Japanese guys. We're judging them based on a comparison to Kyogo. That is extremely true. I mean, I'm not excited. I was ready to go outside and run about just the thought of a Maeda, Kyogo, <laughs> Jota front three and a tatty buzzing about the, buzzing about the, the midfield there, but Joe Porter makes a great point there. It is a gamble, even though we're bringing free, even though we've already got a Japanese player there and he's settled in well. These boys have had a full season. They're coming into a new country, a new culture. We need to hope that they do settle in, but we, we actually do need them to hit the ground running, Brian, eh? Yeah, I think so. But look, any transfers are a risk, isn't it? Even if you know them really well and you think they're going to be great, they might just no work. So I think... I would say most of Angie's sendings so far have been a success. So you have to trust his judgment. The the, the guy um, Dan Horowitz, who's a friend of the channel, who's everywhere at the moment, it's we're getting a lot of information from him. He's a, a Japanese football expert. We're reluctant to people telling us these things. But every every um, <coughs> every team in a gamble, uh, it doesn't matter who it is and how good their pedigree is and how well they've done, it's always a gamble because it's, you say, Kev, they might not quite fit in. You know, they might not like it here, they might not their teammates, it's been to work, they might get injured. These are all things that can happen, so I, I think it's, you know, of course we're comparing them to Kyogo because that's the league he came from. So we're hoping it's on a similar standard, that's natural, so I don't think it's a, I don't think we really can do anything else naturally. But I've got to say though, imagine trying to mark two players with the speed and movement of Kyogo, because apart from Maeda, is very similar, he's super fast, he comes in through the left, so imagine Kyogo's meant to run and you're a defender trying to mark him and you need to be aware of Maeda coming around your other side and Jota tying somebody in knots over on the right. I think it's... In, I, I'm with Kev, like... I'm with the cartwheels down the street here. I can't wait to see them as a front three because I think they're going to prove an absolute nightmare for defences, any defence. And um, I'm really excited. 
Well, William Kennedy comes into reminders these guys haven't got a Scooby Doo. We know that. We know that. We know that, William. That's it's a New Year, same old rubbish on a Wednesday, William. We're we're actually quite happy to admit that. Uh, William's William's been in the comments section having a go at me the whole show, so I'm glad I'm making your day, William. I'll give you a big kiss at the end of this. (laughs) (laughs) Facebook user comes in. Kev Gucci will revel in the fresh air around the hills of Alawa after the exhaust fumes of Japan and the May fumes of Leeds. <laughs> Apol- apologies to any Japanese or people who are listening from Leeds. Um, one last question, I'm going to take it for Twitter because I asked on Twitter last night just before we, we, run out, we run out of time here. Thomas Collins asked me on Twitter, do you think we can go far in the Conference League? We've boosted the squad with these three guys, we don't know what's going to happen. We've probably got a 50-50 chance against Bodo Glimp even though we don't know what, what uh, team we're going to face because uh, of, of their players leaving. I'm willing to have a crack at this. I, I want to have a crack at the Conference League. It's not where I want to be. Definitely no. But I'm willing to have a crack at it. Brian, what do you think? Yeah, agreed. I think our European performances have been pretty good. And again, a lot of teams going to be a patchwork squad or squads that have been um, are against very good teams. So I think... You know, get up to speed, get the players playing, um, playing aggressively, playing the, the, the same way, you know, pressing high, high tempo, counter-attacking. I think we've got a good chance against most teams. Um, and yeah, I think we could go, and it's not to disrespect the, the danger. The only slight caveat is the danger with the, the Conference League is that it's not Europa League. And there's this idea that the teams in it are all garbage and we should walk it. Because even though we've had a, a, not a very good recent history in Europe, there is the idea that we should definitely beat them. Never heard of them, and we know that's not the case. So there is a, a danger of that, and you don't mind going to a, a a huge name in Europe because you go well. We tried, and they were just better. So there is that sort of worry, but no, I don't have any fears going into it. I think I've got faith in Andrew and what he's trying to do, and I think we've said from the start, you know, he's Celtic completely Scottish football, and it's about Europe and testing yourself in Europe and trying to get to that level. So um, yeah, I, I think we'll, we'll do well. I've no fear. Colin, what's your thoughts about the, the Conference League? I'm, I've, I had a comment there from Paul here. I'll get it back up. Don't care, to be honest. Let's get the SPFL under control. What's your thoughts on the Conference League and how far we can go in it? I'd like to see us just win the first tie over two legs in Europe since 2004. I think that start needs to get kibosh this season as soon as possible um, mm-hmm. and put it to the history books where it deserves to be. Look, we're looking at this team, Bodo Glimt. They've sold four or five of their key players. One of their players looks as if he's going to make the move to Scotland to sign for Hibs as well. If that's, a, I know obviously they had the great performances against Roma, but if they're a team that's looking to rebuild as well, we've got to take advantage of that. They're going to be coming in straight off their pre-season. We should have these guys up and running. Look, just I, I want Celtic to get into every game to believe that they have the ability to beat the team that they're playing. And if that means that you go on a run in Europe, then that's fantastic because it'll bring an extra revenue, it'll bring an extra coefficient points as much as anybody kind of moans about them. Let's just go and try and win every single game that we're in because I watched a Celtic team last year that looked as if they'd gave up from the minute that the first whistle went. This season, I'm not seeing that and I want to keep doing that. So let's just keep trying to win as much as we can and see what it takes us at the end of the season. And hail, hail to that. Henry, I'm going to give the last comment to Henry Lally. Uh, guys, Ange's style is pressing. In order to achieve this, with the number of games we have, a settled first 11 for me is a thing of the past. More squad, squad rotation in the future. I think he's right there. And with the three guys we've brung in, we are really, really excited. All three is are absolutely buzzing out our nuts for a Wednesday afternoon when we're all in isolation today. Uh, Kev, just before we finish up, was there not one more question? That came through on Twitter. Eh, uh, what one are you, are you going on about? Was it the one I, about a, a certain hat? I think it was a certain hat that we've not seen in a long, long time. Okay, two seconds in, two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> He's um, back. He's back. The, the, the mustard hat still exists. And, and I'll, 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 I'll maybe, we'll, maybe we'll come out of retirement eventually. Lads, this has been great. I've really enjoyed this, this Wednesday afternoon lunchtime. I hope everybody else has. And 
Hey, if you haven't got any, anything good to say about anybody, just didn't say nothing at all. Hail, hail and keep it Celtic.